ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया Uh, we are just starting the seventh chapter of the Gita today, and we went through the first six or seven verses last week. But we're probably just gonna we're gonna go through them again quickly um, as something of an introduction. And over the last fifteen hundred years or so commentators have mentioned that the Gita, which consists of 18 chapters, neatly divides into three sections. The first six, middle six, and last six chapters. Um, A lot of times when people are commentating on and interpreting sacred texts, and if they're spiritual in nature, that's a process called exegesis, where you draw the meaning out of a text. A lot of times, the commentators will end up negotiating with the text. And what I mean when I say negotiating is they have a pre-existing idea or philosophy, and then they need to liaise with the text in order to make the text say what they want it to say. You follow this? So you get people and they belong to a particular group and their group holds a given text as sacred but it's not that that tradition derives exactly from that text. The tradition may have a number of influences it may be more or less related to the text it considers sacred. Um... I mean, you know, an example almost everybody be familiar with is uh, Protestant Christianity vis-a-vis the Bible. And certainly it's not that there's nothing in the Bible, in the New Testament, um, that isn't there and reflected in Protestant Christianity. But I mean, there's... Uh, things like the hypostatic union, for example, which is the very important to early Christianity and to the modern time concept that Jesus was fully human and fully divine simultaneously. Something which is logically impossible. doesn't even make sense. It's like saying a square circle. Um... But that idea you're not going to find exactly articulated in the Bible. And so when Christian theologians want to find that doctrine in the Bible, they end up pulling a verse from here, pulling a verse from here, pulling a verse from here, giving a nuanced reading of that, reconciling this verse with that, adding in a little bit of Greek philosophy, and what have you, and then they come up with this idea. And it's not that the idea is not related at all to the text. But there's nothing like a sense in which this is the self-evident meaning of the text. Rather, it's a pre-existing idea that somebody then brings back and looks at the text and figures out a way to negotiate with and find evidence to support their point of view from the text. I remember seeing a cartoon some decades ago, and it was like, you know, the... somebody was praying to Jesus and Jesus was sitting right there in front of him. He was saying, you know, you are fully human and fully divine, one with the Father in substance and yet different inconceivably, the mysterium tremendum, the great mystery. And, and, and Jesus was like, what? <laughs> he was like, you know, he was, you know, he was, these ideas which are very philosophical in nature and, um, 
you don't find them, let's say, in the Sermon on the Mount, or even in the four Gospels for that matter. And so when you do exegesis, when you draw a meaning out of a text, if you're not just a complete buffoon, you have to follow rules of interpretation, which are called hermeneutics. And serious philosophical traditions have a system of hermeneutics, a system of rules which govern the way you read and interpret a text. Just to make it simple, let's say I was talking and Dom asked me if I want something to drink and I said, no thanks. And then five minutes later, Shri asked me if I wanted something to drink and I said, yeah, come to think of it, I'd like a glass of water. Now you've got two statements on record from me. One is I don't want anything to drink and the second statement is that I would like a glass of water. And people could have an argument about which one correctly represented my worldview. And, you know, they could discount Dom. As, I, Dom was insincere, therefore I didn't tell him what I really wanted to. And Sri was a more sincere person. And so, you know, being from a Jewish background, and so I was more honest with her about, about my likes and dislikes. And, you know, Dom asked this question to me in a challenging way, so I said no. But then Sri asked in a humble way, so I said yes. There could be all sorts of theories. And you, could, you write books on it engaging in ad hominem attacks about them and, you know, their character and, you know, what the implications, or maybe I don't make any sense and I'm contradicting myself and I'm, you know, you know, I, Tukaram's teachings are in, you know, a pre-philosophical period where, you know, in the culture he was from, it wasn't considered to be wrong to directly contradict himself like many ancient cultures and, you know, a working philosophy and a coherent philosophy took place at a much later time period than Tukram existed at. They could just like a whole all these ideas, right? But then if you introduced a hermeneutic like a later statement supersedes a prior one. You follow? Then all of a sudden there's a resolution. Tukram wasn't thirsty then, then later once you introduce that idea, then you can look at the timestamp on the request, and all of a sudden the thing is really easy to understand. And so, when you get into a sacred text, there's, there's several ways you can go about dealing with it. One is you can have a pre-existing philosophy, and then you can read it into your text. And sometimes it's a square peg in a round hole, sometimes it fits relatively well, it's not an awful fit. But, you know, you're retrofitting your pre-existing idea onto an older text and your catechism, your organized systematic teaching may not actually be the organization and systematization of that earlier text. We don't know. If it was, you wouldn't need a philosophy. You'd just be able to open the book and that would be your philosophy. And you'd be able to paint by numbers because it would take you through each step you know, consecutively. So anyway, one thing that happens is you, you approach a sacred text and you've got a pre-existing idea about what it needs to say. And then when you encounter things that are problematic, you have to create a system of um, a, really a hierarchy where you weight certain items as being more substantial than others. And you explain some items away and you get rid of contradictions and you resolve things. Um, Another way of approaching a text is just to say, let's try to figure out what the author was intending. In either case, in either case, um, you need a set of rules. You need a logic that you follow to help you make sense out of the statements. And so even just the idea of premises and conclusions, basic ideas and then logic, that you build on premises to reach conclusions. You stack premises together like all men are mortal is a premise. Socrates as a man is another premise. This is a major premise. This is a minor, minor premise. The major premise is very, very large in its application. All men are mortal. All humans are mortal. Socrates is a human. That's an instance of the first category. 
So Socrates being a human fits within the umbrella of all humans are mortal. So now Socrates is an instance of a human, and we know something about human, and therefore you can reach the conclusion Socrates is mortal. Major premise and a minor premise. All humans, mortal. Socrates, human. Just like in algebra, you cross out the terms of the same, which is human, and you're left with Socrates is, is mortal. Did you guys follow that? So you might, not even know, you might not even know what you're doing, but all of us are trained to think reasonably. We're all trained to have some basic ideas about logic. The world is made following rules, following patterns. We use these things to survive and thrive. And so even without any formal training in critical thinking or formal logic, Everybody automatically has like at least like, like an intermediate degree in logic and reason. Sometimes that gets you in trouble. Like all monkeys like bananas. Jimmy? Jimmy likes bananas. Ergo, Jimmy's a monkey. Huh? You must be a monkey also. <laughs> and so that might slip by, and you're like, well, obviously that's not true, but that sounded logical. Well, it would have to be all monkeys and only monkeys like bananas. If you just say all monkeys like bananas, and Jimmy likes bananas, you can't say whether he's a monkey or not, because other species could like bananas too. What we could do is we could figure out if Jimmy didn't like bananas, then we could for sure rule out that he was a monkey. We could prove the negative, we couldn't prove the positive. If we modified the initial statement a little bit and said all monkeys and only monkeys like bananas, then whether he liked them or not would determine whether or not he was a monkey. And so we all have a general sense of logic because the world's actually logical and it follows rules and patterns and we recognize these to survive. And given that our brains, and specifically our prefrontal cortices, are so ridiculously large compared to other animals, our ability to recognize patterns and sort through them is just orders of magnitude beyond other animals. We're really good at it. Which is why we have things like propositional logic and modal logic and you know, in mathematics and all sorts of stuff that doesn't exist in the animal kingdom. What to speak of language. We can even communicate all this stuff to other people. Um, we have recursive language, where you can stack ideas on top of each other almost unlimitedly. I went to the store with my friend on this day to buy this thing for this party, on this date, in this city. And you can just idea after idea after idea, unlimitedly. Animals can't do that. They may have some primitive language. They don't have recursive language. So whenever you look at a text and you're trying to figure out what it's saying, you either got a pre-existing idea and you gotta, you got to make the text fit with that, or you don't have a pre-existing idea. Either way, you got to have some logic and some set of rules if you want to draw out that meaning. And so hermeneutics and exegesis, rules of interpretation, in order to draw out meaning, are required any time you approach a piece of literature. You can look at things like when the literature was written, um, prevailing ideas and mores within that culture. But the starting place, before you get into any of that sociological stuff, is you have to understand some basic grammar. And you have to be able to read the text. And so we are going to look at about 13 verses in the Gita, maybe the seventh chapter, verse 1 through 13 or 14. Depends how far we get. And we're going to really focus on understanding what the text says. And the books are there for you to read along with me. So when I'm going through the verses with you, don't look at me. Look at the books because I'm going to try to show you exactly what the text says. Now, when you 
generally speaking, when you read a Bible or a Quran or something like that, maybe the Quran, but this book was designed to give you an entry into the Sanskrit language. We're all about what the book actually says, as you're about to find out. And nowadays, in spiritual traditions, they don't do this verse-by-verse -verse translation and commentary. It's not standard these days anymore. People more write novels, or they do a straight translation, and they do different flavored translations. Sometimes a literal translation, sometimes a contemporary translation, you know, sometimes a, a guide for dummies translation. There's different, there's different um, um, styles. And so ours is going to be tending towards the literal. Now, commentators for the last 1,500 years have said that the Gita neatly divides into three sections. The first six chapters are about karma, second six chapters are about bhakti, and the third six chapters are about jnana. Duty, devotion, and knowledge. The problem is those terms, karma, jnana, and bhakti, show up in every chapter of the Gita. So the idea that you have a discrete division between six chapters of this, six chapters, just fails instantly. Because you have those terms used over and over again in every chapter of the Gita. So this would be, it couldn't be, uh, you know, like when you're categorizing things, when you're, when you're doing taxonomies, there's a principle called MISI, mutually exclusive, comprehensively exhaustive. Each category should be mutually exclusive of the others, so there's no overlap. And then when you take them all together, they should be comprehensively exhausted. They should completely describe the phenomenon. Like fauna and flora, for example, to describe life forms in biology. You've got to add bacteria in if you want to be complete. Sometimes they're, they're included as very, very simple fauna. Um, you have things like coral, which were called plantimals up until the 60s when they finally realized it was just a non-moving animal and they reclassified them as animals. Um, and so when we look at these three sections of the Gita, which most commentators over the last 1,500 years, hundreds of them, have agreed with this categorizing of the Gita. They couldn't have possibly, and their, their commentaries are written in Sanskrit, so, you know, they really understood the text. It was their native tongue, in many cases. Um, they couldn't have possibly thought it was fully discrete categories. So there's some overlap in the categories. But then what you're left with is just like this theory, it's like an idea. Is, is, does the text actually neatly divide into three sets of six chapters? Does it not? What's the evidence for it? So one piece of evidence that the text neatly divides into three sections is that each section, the first part of the second chapter, which is when Krishna begins speaking, the first part of the seventh chapter, and the first part of the thirteenth chapter, all three sections include an ontology. An ontology is a fancy word for a systematic philosophy of what exists fundamentally. So an ontology today would be uh, irreducible fundamental particles like gluons, neutrinos, and other sub-subatomic particles that build into subatomic atoms, molecules, and then the world around you, combined with fundamental forces like gravity and electromagnetism and strong and weak nuclear force. Um, which is what keeps atoms together and what um, allows for things to disintegrate through radioactivity. And so you take these fundamental forces and these fundamental particles and that is the entirety of the world you see around you. When you see you know, Kumi with her lightning colored yellow hair and her cool maroon little matching outfit, that ultimately the whole thing just breaks down into a bunch of fundamental particles which are being held together and moved 
by a bunch of fundamental forces. That would be like a modern day ontology of what exists. So Krishna starts out each of these three sections with an ontology, and the ontologies stack on top of one another. The first one's the most primitive. He distinguishes between the body and the soul. The third one that happens in the 13th chapter is the most complex. It has about 20, 25 categories. And this one is sort of right in the middle. It has nine categories. And so one piece of evidence that Krishna himself was intending for his book or his speech to have three sections is that he starts off each section with a repetitive but moving forward ontology, like a helix. That's a circle that moves forward. Or like a light motif in music, where you'll have a repetition of notes, but they're developed throughout the piece. Like Beethoven's fifth and the four notes. Dun, 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 dun. And the same four notes. Dun, 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 dun. And the same four notes. Same four notes. That's why it's a great piece of music. Because he's able to evolve the feeling and the cadence and the rhythm and evoke emotions and awe and reverence and veneration and horror and exaltation and all that with the same notes. And that repetition isn't necessarily a fault when the repetition is done elegantly and beautifully. That repetition can allow you to stack ideas and take people to higher and higher levels of understanding by not giving them everything all at once when they're too infantile to appreciate it. And so then you work with them, it's therapeutic. And in the same way that you might give a certain therapy to somebody at a particular level they're at, and then you build on that. And you start off with really small weights and a little bit of like, you know, balancing exercises for your knee after you've had knee surgery. And then eventually you develop where you're jumping and running and playing and doing plyometrics and all sorts of stuff. And so, but you, you can't do it all at once because the person's not ready for it. So you're building and the principles are building, loading on your knee, developing the, uh, the integrity you know, the, of, the, of the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments around your knee. So we are now going to, in some ways, drop into the beginning of the Gita. We're six chapters in. We're roughly 40% through the text. But we're going to drop in, and it's going to be as if we're almost starting again. And it, you're going to see that. And that's going to substantiate that... Do me a favor, open that door and that door for me. Thank you. That's going to substantiate that this idea of how to analyze the text by breaking into three sections isn't arbitrary. Is that one open already? Isn't arbitrary. There's some good logic behind it. And you... It's not that interesting. It's just opening the door. It's not special. <laughs> All the actions happen here. <laughs> I mean, I don't, maybe you're checking out this bum. I don't know, but if the, other than that, the actions happen in here. Um, it's not that any analysis of a text is automatically arbitrary. It's not that any analysis is just one person saying it means one thing and another person saying it means another thing. When you can show logic and reason and evidence for why you're looking at a text the way you are, you move into a different realm where it's not just I'm retrofitting my idea on the text. It rather becomes I'm exploring the meaning very carefully. And the more carefully somebody does that, the more they're going to get closer to what the author originally intended. So what I want to do, and kind of prime your pump for reading now, is that we're looking for what's really being said. We're looking for what foundational ideas are being introduced. 
we're looking at is it reasonable to see that the Gita has three just you know distinct sections maybe not mutually exclusive but distinct distinct enough to warrant mentioning do we find a repetition of themes are those themes evolving what do we see when we read the text that's what we're going for I don't know what clock I'm on because you never turn the clock on but just give me give me something so I know look up here look up here at instant tell me what I'm looking at huh all right 25 minutes so it is um So we are on page, in my book, 309. Your page numbers might differ a little bit. We're on text 1, chapter 7. You guys see it? Okay, we're going to move fast now because I'm going over information we already covered last week. But it will be next to impossible if you weren't here last week and you're just dropping in this week to understand where we're going without reading these initial verses. So we're going to go through them quickly. And then... We're going to start the new material. All right, here we go. Mi asakta manaparta yoga yunja madashaya asang shayam samagra mam yatag yasyasi tatranu. Tatranu. Hear that. Hear what I'm saying. It's in the imperative. Very rare that Krishna uses the imperative in the Gita. Generally, Krishna uses it's chapter 7, text 1. It's chapter 7, text 1. Page 309 in my book. Maybe a little different in your book. All right. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I'm not lying to you. <laughs> 309 in my book might be a little different in your book. <laughs> just, just like I said it. Um, Maya, so he says, touch your new. Listen to that. This is in the imperative. This is rare. Normally Krishna speaks in the optative you could do this. Um, he might speak conditionally. If you do this, then this will happen. But unlike other religious texts, Krishna doesn't often give straight instructions. Do this. Listen to this. Even now, he's not saying do this. He's just saying listen. And he's building up some momentum. He's feeling closer to Arjuna from the last chapter. And so he's getting a little more direct in his instruction. Just like when you develop a rapport with somebody, you can speak to them more directly. I was talking to someone yesterday who I've known since they were born, but they moved away to Dallas when they were four years old. I haven't seen them in 17 years. or 21 now. And they came to visit me yesterday with their mom and their sister, who I've also known. You know, I've known their mom for 30 years and their sister for whatever, since she was born. And he was asking me some questions uh, about the usage of psychedelics. And at some point I said, hey, I'm going to be blunt with you because you're family. We've known each other forever. And then when I said I'm going to be blunt with you, everybody, everybody was just doing their own thing in the event. But when I said I'm going to be blunt with you, everybody kind of stopped and sort of like, <laughs> like started. Because <laughs> that, that means, you know, it's, that means I'm, it's, it's, it's going to get, it's going to get a little muddy. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go for the jugular. And uh, the, the indirect stuff's going to go out the window. And I'm going I'm to get real specific and real surgical and, and, and make my points as, as strong as I possibly can. Um, Krishna's feeling that confidence here. Listen to this. Listen to what? Mai asakta mana. With your mind absorbed in me. Yoga yunjam. Practicing yoga, literally yogaing yoga, because it has the same root. You follow? So it's like if I was to say, mm, like, it's, no one would say making moves in English, I'm making some moves, but you could, it wouldn't make sense, but you could say it. There's nothing grammatically incorrect about it. You could say, I'm moving moves. You follow? And there's, no, there's some poetic value in the repetition of roots. And so I'm moving moves. I'm moving movable moves in motion to make the most out of things. Now you're getting into alliteration where you're repeating the, the same syllable again and again. 
but moving, motion, moves, movable. They're all the same root. And so, yoga yunjam is that. You're yoga in yoga. But that doesn't, it doesn't really make sense when you say it like that in English. So you'd say practicing yoga. Madashraya, taking shelter of me. So listen to me tell you how, if you absorb your mind in me, practice yoga, and take shelter of me, then samagram, asangshayam samagram, without any doubt and completely, yas yasi, you will know me. It's in the future tense, second person. You will know me. You will know me completely without any doubt if you take shelter of me, absorb your mind in me, and practice yoga. Listen to me tell you about that. Listen to me tell you yata, how you will be able to do that. Now here, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. You hear how close that translation is to the Sanskrit? It's a very literal translation. Not all translations in this book are going to be that literal. This one is particularly literal. So, there's a few things happening here. Krishna's getting much more direct. He mentions himself three times. Taking shelter of me, absorbing your mind in me, you can know me fully. And so, whereas in the first six chapters, things were much more about you and your duty and spirit versus matter and being spiritual versus being materialistic, in this chapter, Krishna's getting a lot more direct in his theism. He's referring to himself as the deity. He's getting much more comfortable laying out theistic devotion, where you start to view the world in relationship to divinity. It's just, it's just it's right there in the first verse. It's, it's, this is the only verse in the Gita thus far where Krishna mentions himself three times in a single verse. So there's a change. There's a change in the tempo of the Gita. And if you know the Gita, this verse, it, 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 there's, a, there's a difference in the feeling of the verse. Not arbitrarily, like I feel it different, like I'm some kind of avant-garde jazz musician. I'm telling you there's a different feel and you've got to spend a bunch of years trying to figure out what I'm saying. Not like that. But, like I remember Herbie Hancock, you guys know who Herbie Hancock is? And so Herbie Hancock was talking about, he used to play with Miles Davis. Do you guys know that? He played piano with Miles Davis. And Miles Davis talked about like buttery notes. And Herbie Hancock spent years trying to figure out what that meant, you know? <laughs> it's not like that. I'm not telling you about buttery notes or something like that, something obscure and exotic that's meant to be, you know, like a koan that you're going to meditate on. I'm, I'm showing you my math. Krishna's repeating the idea of me three times of taking shelter of me. Previously he says, Budhao Sharanam Anvicha, take shelter of enlightenment. Now he's saying directly, take shelter of me. Absorb your mind in me. And you can know me. This also introduces the idea that knowing divinity is the goal of life. There's just a, a very overt, direct theism which is now being articulated in the Gita because Krishna's warmed up his audience. Jnanam teham savigyanam idam pravakshami asheshita yatva neha buyo nyaj yatavyam avashishite. So, idam vakshami, I am speaking this, asheshita, fully. Jnanam Teham, to you, I am speaking this fully, this knowledge, Savigyanam. This knowledge along with special knowledge. Vigyanas means special knowledge. I'm speaking to you knowledge and special knowledge. Now you've got to figure out what does that mean in this context. This is a very standard compound in Sanskrit. Jnana, Vigyana, knowledge, special knowledge. And then depending on the context, the verses around it, 
you'll understand what it means. It could be book smarts and street smarts. It could be theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge. It could be spiritual knowledge and devotional knowledge. It could be material knowledge and spiritual knowledge. It could be general knowledge and specific knowledge of a given subject. It's a compound which is used in the Sanskrit language and then it's up to you to work out what it means based on looking at the subsequent verses. So keep that in mind. Yanam te hum. Knowledge to you, I, savigyanam, with, not, with special knowledge, idam bakshami, this I speak, asheshita completely. I am going to speak this to you completely, knowledge along with special knowledge. That's going to then allow you to know me. Yagyat ba, having known this, having known this in the past, having known this. Nehabuyo anyat yatavyam avishishte. Nothing other, nothing else will remain in this world for you to know. It's a big claim. Once you know this, there will be nothing left in this world for you to know. You'll know everything. Sasarvavit, you know everything. This is a standard formula where when you introduce a, a, a new book, when you start a new book, you have this thing called a chatushtaya. It's a standard fourfold thing you do at the beginning of a text where you explain the qualifications you have to have in order to study the text, what the main theme is of the text, what the result is of understanding the text. There's, there's like a standard formula at the beginning of a... Of, there's a standard formula at the beginning of a formal text. It's a formal formula. That's again, that repetition. It's a formal formula at the outset of a text which indicates you're starting a new book and a new idea is being introduced. The idea is introduced in brief. The result of knowing the idea is going to be in brief and introduced in brief. And then, and then the qualifications you need to have. Like to take Spanish 3, you have to take in Spanish 1 and Spanish 2. I shall now declare to you in full this knowledge, both phenomenal and numinous. This being known, nothing further shall remain for you to know. Uh, the word phenomenal and numinous comes from René Descartes, from Cartesian dualism, the famous French philosopher who you know, articulated the mind-body distinction. And so that language is borrowed from him. It's modified a little bit. He said phenomenal and numinal, this is phenomenal and numinous. We'll get to that in a minute. But, well, I spent a lot of time on that last week, but this week we're just going through it quickly. So what's happening here is Krishna is glorifying what he's about to teach us in order to whet our appetite and make us pay attention. I'm going to teach you something. It's really important. Once you know this, there'll be nothing left for you to know. In other words, listen to me. That's the purpose of this kind of a formal introduction to a subject matter, is it piques the interest of and garners the attention of the audience. Manushanam sasre shu kaschid yatati sidhae, yatanam api sidhanam kaschid mam veti tatvata. Out of many thousands of people, someone might strive for perfection. Out of many such strivers, and even out of many such people who have achieved perfection, maybe someone will truly know me. Now Krishna is articulating just how special what he's about to teach us is, because it's a thousand times a thousand times a thousand, we're getting into the billion category. At a time when the population of the world wasn't even a billion. It's important to note. He was written thousands of years ago when the population of the earth was well under a billion. <laughs> so it's a, it's a furthering of this idea that this is very, very special. Listen very carefully. Not only will nothing further remain to be known, but it's very rare for someone to know this. You felt like you could say, you could say, hey, you know, sharing is caring. There's nothing else you need to know in life. Sharing is caring. And every kid, you know, should learn that in, in, in kindergarten or preschool. So it's an idea that you could argue there's nothing else you need to know but it's not a very rare idea. 
It's not a very rare idea. Love is its own reward. There, there, there are ideas like this which are fairly common. Maybe people understand it, maybe they don't. That's another subject. But they're fairly easy to articulate. They're quite well known, even cliched to some extent. But we're getting two things here. Number one is there's nothing else for you to know. And number two is it's very, very rare that someone actually understands this. So now Krishna is going to begin to teach, having followed the standard formula that you find in all manner of Sanskrit texts, ancient Sanskrit texts, where subjects are introduced in a very formal way. And now Krishna is going to begin to teach what he's intending to teach. Out of many thousands of men, <clears throat> one may endeavor for perfection. <clears throat> and of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. Next verse. Earth, water, fire, air, space, mind, intelligence, and false ego. All together, these eight constitute my separated material energies. My bhina, prakriti, ashtada. My eight separated energies. Bhina means separated. Prakriti means nature. Mum, my. My separated energies. Krishna is separating himself from matter. But not saying. There's a very, very standard idea within Christianity that the world was created by God ex nihilo, from nothing. That means the world has nothing intrinsically relating it to God. That means the world is mammon and it's of the devil and it's other than God. And God is up there, not down here. And things down here are evil. Women are evil, money's evil. Everybody's got to give away their wealth and walk around Galilee barefoot, pick up the cross and follow Jesus. And if you hoard wealth, you're not one of his disciples. There's like a real strong tendency towards renunciation in the early church. It's all over the Bible. And so this idea was there that the world was material. The world was created ex nihilo, from nothing. Therefore, it had no intrinsic relationship to God. It was a dualistic world opposite the monistic pagan world, where everything was seen as divine in some sort of pantheistic sense, that everything had a divine element to it. And Christianity distinguished itself from that pantheistic worldview, that pagan worldview, with a radical dualism, so radical that they had to come up with a devil. Because all the bad stuff had to come from somewhere, so it had to come from the devil. And now you really have almost like two deities because you've got this incredibly powerful devil and God and you know, like that one bird on each shoulder giving you advice a la screw tape letters. Anybody ever heard of screw tape letters? It's a book by C.S. Lewis about a guy who had a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other. And so this, you know, this idea is very common within especially modern day Christianity, but going back, because they had to figure out a way to account for all the bad stuff that existed. It's a dualistic world. Krishna's not doing that. He's also not saying this is 100% me. He's saying it's my separate energy. So then you, you, you're left wondering, well, is there something that's not separated from you? So there is some distance being created from the material and Krishna's laying out a brief ontology. Essentially fundamental particles. Earth, water, fire, air, space. Fundamental concepts of matter. Interesting, mind, intelligence, and ahankar, which literally means I am the doer. I do. Ahankar means I is a hum, and kar means do. I do. Ahamkar. And so that's the standard word for, that's a Sanskrit word for false ego. <clears throat> this idea that you're the maker. <clears throat> You're independent. You're not under anything. You're not governed by anything. You're completely free in this world. That genetics don't rule you. That there aren't things outside of yourself that control you. That you're not under the influence, for instance, of gravity. You're not under the influence of time and all sorts of other things. But you're independent. You can do whatever you want. You're absolutely free. That's false ego because it's not representative of reality. The reality is you are a lot less free than you might like to think. You're a lot more manipulable than you might think. 
your attitudes and predilections and appetites are much more determined by your family and your early childhood than you, rather than your free choice. Then you might want to admit. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, you know, Rene Descartes in a traditional mind-body distinction situation, everything mental is in one category the soul, the mind, all that's in one category, and then physical matters in the other. And Descartes did this because nobody could account for consciousness in the 17th century. Just like nobody can account for consciousness now. He might have been the 1700s. It might have been 18th century. Nobody could account for consciousness. And they were trying to do science, but they had to explain the mind, but nobody could figure it out. So they divided the world into two buckets. A mental world we don't have to worry about, and now we can just look at the physical world. We're actually still suffering from the compartmentalization of Rene Descartes centuries ago because we still don't have an explanation for consciousness. It's still the battleground between spiritualists and materialists. If you read philosophical periodicals, quarterlies of professional philosophers doing philosophy published this year, this is still the hot topic of debate. The hard problem of consciousness. Why are we conscious? How do you account for conscious? How do chemicals with you know, electricity become conscious? How does life come from matter? Why are we conscious at all? Is conscious a fundamental particle of reality? Or is it derivative of chemical states? This is... It's a major topic within philosophy of mind, as it has been forever. Anyway, Descartes lumped everything non-physical into one bucket. The Gita doesn't do that. The Gita actually considers mind, intelligence, and false ego to be material, subtle material. It's called sukshma prakriti, subtle matter, as opposed to stula prakriti, gross matter. And so there's earth, water, fire, air, space, and then there's mind, intelligence, ego, and they're all material. They're all not the self. They're all coverings to the self. So it's a tripartite theory where the soul is one thing and then the mind and matter are both two different facets of materialism. And so the world separated into three buckets. Consciousness proper, contaminated consciousness as uh, as seen through a material mind, which is subtle, paranormal, but still material, and then gross matter. How do we know that? Is that my theory? No, it's here. Krishna lumps in into the bina prakriti, the separated energy, mind, intelligence, and ego, indicating that he sees them as being material. Further evidence by the next verse Aparyam itas tu anyam prakritim vidi me parang jiva bhuta mahabaho yaya idam daryate jagat. Apara iam itas tu anyam prakritim vidi me parang. Know, know that my superior energy, know that I have a superior, an energy which is superior to, there is another energy which is superior to this inferior energy. Know that there is another energy which is superior to this inferior energy, is literally what Krishna is saying. And that superior energy is Jiva Bhuta. It's living beings. It's living beings. Bhu is the Sanskrit root to be, and so Bhuta literally is being, like a living being. Jiva means living. Jiva Bhuta, living beings. Yaya idam dharya te jagat. They are animating this world. You are the soul. You have a body. We bring light into this world. Consciousness, life, animates matter. Matter is like a car. Consciousness is the driver. Matter is like a, matter is like a computer. Consciousness is the operator of the computer. The world of matter is animated by conscious beings. That conscious being is fundamentally different than matter. 
Spirit is irreducible. Spirit is what you are. Spirit doesn't divide into something smaller. It's a fundamental particulate of reality. The same way you have gluons and bosons, you also have souls. You are a soul, you have a body. This is a cornerstone of our theology. Like if you become a devotee in our tribe, we teach you you're the soul and not the body, right? We teach you you're not your mind, you're something divine. You're not your body, you can watch your thoughts, you're beyond your thoughts. We teach this very commonly. This idea directly derives from the Gita. This is not an instance of us retrofitting an idea onto an older text. This is not that. This rather is directly espoused in the text. It's Krishna's worldview. Besides these, there's another superior energy of mind, which comprises the living entities who are exploiting the resources of this material inferior nature. It says they maintain or they hold up. You can see Prabhupada getting a little fast and loose with this translation. They're exploiting the resources of this material nature. So Prabhupada is he's giving a little poke because that's actually true. It's not what the text says. The text doesn't speak of exploitation per se. It doesn't speak of resources. It just says, Darya te jagat, they maintain the world. But, but, it's, you see Prabhupada here being a theologian. He's taking the idea and putting it into a modern context to be educational. That we shouldn't exploit the world. That we should serve the world. That we should be of service. That we should maintain the world and not exploit it. And that's not wrong. It's not wrong for a translator to, to put a little oomph on something that they think is important. Especially not when he's got the word by word right there so you can get a literal translation if you want one. Especially not when there's a purport where he also gives literal ideas. But you can see there Prabhupada poking a little bit. You know, for a little bit of spiritual environmentalism, a little bit of stoicism, a little bit of voluntary austerity, not just taking everything you could possibly get out of this world, but putting something back. All created beings have their source in these two natures of all this material and all this spiritual. Know for certain that I am both the origin and the dissolution. Eta yonani bhutani sarvaniti. All beings, this womb. All beings have this as their womb, the spiritual nature. Upadaya, understand this. Aham kritsnasya jagata pravata pralayasata. I am completely the origin and the dissolution of the entire universe. It's interesting, but Krishna is not saying that the material world is unrelated to him. He's claiming the material world. And there's implications of that. If you claim the material world, you have to claim, to some extent, death and suffering. This gets into theodicy, the attempt to explain how an all-good and all-powerful God could allow for evil to exist in this world, or, alternatively, could allow for suffering to exist in this world. Now you get into, well, you know, suffering was done by you to her. Okay, that takes care of mortal evil, but what about natural evil, congenital heart defects? Twins are born, one of them has a congenital heart defect, the other one doesn't. That proves that if God existed and God created those two children, that he could have just as easily made them both healthy because one of them was made healthy, but the other one wasn't. That would mean that God is evil, unworthy of worship, because he allowed one person to suffer unnecessarily. The proof it was unnecessary is one person was born healthy, the other one was born unhealthy. These aren't directly dealt with in the Gita in this chapter. However, it's not possible to read a serious text and not ask questions like this. These questions are a natural consequence of reading a text. And so you can maybe you can account for mortal evil, but not natural evil. You got to come up with an explanation for that. Also, even mortal evil is problematic because why would God have created two people with free will such that you could torture and kill somebody else? 
It's like a parent allowing their children to do Lord of the Flies. What kind of loving parent is that? Are you following these questions? They go beyond today's class. They're relatively easy to resolve. We believe in karma. We believe karma goes on for more than one lifetime. So whatever happens to you, you did something to deserve it. And if it happened when you were a little kid, you probably did something in your last life to deserve it. That is, in any religion on the planet, the only way to reconcile an all-good and all-powerful God with suffering. There is no other explanation for suffering in this world that allows for an all-good and all-powerful God to exist except for to hang all of it on us. Otherwise, if God arbitrarily, for no good reason, makes somebody suffer, you follow? He's a horrific person. Doesn't deserve to have kids. What do we do to parents who make their kids suffer unnecessarily in horrible, horrible ways? We take their kids away. God becomes an illegitimate parent, an unqualified parent, a parent who only gets supervised visits. parent with a no contact order um, I want to give you guys a sense of you know what the text is saying but then also you know what the implications and when you start to go down this rabbit hole you have to start thinking about these ideas and working them out you have to start working through them that's what happens when you're looking at you know, serious theology, when you're dealing with big ideas like the idea of God, the idea of an origin of all existence, the idea of loving God, these questions naturally come up. They'll come up for everybody, anywhere in the world, at any time. There are questions for everybody. Who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Where did it all come from? These are the questions everybody asks. And in many ways, the Gita is answering those questions. Who am I? You're a spiritual being, distinct from the material world around you. Why am I here? You're here to know your maker. Who's not completely divorced from the material, but is much more directly related to the spiritual. The spiritual is para prakriti is superior energy. The material is bina prakriti, separated energy. Krishna is creating a hierarchy in terms of his energies, where some of them are considered to be more primary and some of them secondary. That hierarchy, that sacred order, is, is created by Krishna himself. All right. And then Krishna gives us a little analogy. There is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. It's a beautiful analogy. It's a simile, pearl, pearls on a thread, but it's an analogy because Krishna... An analogy is when you explain your metaphor. A metaphor is a broad category which has many different types of poetic devices used to communicate things. And within metaphors, a simile is one type of metaphor. We use eva. I use in Sanskrit it would be eva, like or as. You're as big as a house, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? You know, who's that guy? Oh, he's a monster. See, it's different. He's as big as a house. It's clear I'm comparing him to a house in terms of his largest. He's a monster. I'm literally saying he's a monster. They both pack different metaphors. He is this. She is this. They are that. Usually packs a little more punch in terms of shocking people. And then an analogy is all things rest upon me as pearls rest upon a thread. You explain the lines of connection between the two objects which are being compared. You guys following this? You have a tenor and a vehicle and a ground and a tension, kind of the standard features of a metaphor. You have different types of metaphors, you have extended metaphors, 
dead metaphors and they get so overused they don't even sound like a metaphor anymore. Like table legs. <laughs> At one time that was a that was a metaphor. But it's just so common now. You know, you have extended metaphors, mixed metaphors, we use multiple metaphors, implied metaphors, direct metaphors. But they're all trying to compare something that's difficult to fathom to something that's easier to fathom in order for you to orient yourself and understand something. And so Krishna uses metaphors. After he explains what he wants to say directly, he then uses a metaphor to give you a little food for thought. It's a, it's a powerful tool. A lot of times we use metaphors when we're too lazy to figure out what we want to say, and we use a metaphor, but the problem there is we usually can't explain the metaphor very well, and so we leave it up to the person listening to us to be smarter than us and figure out what we're trying to say. But because the nature of a metaphor is it's a little bit amorphous and you can interpret it in various ways, you end, up, you end up leaving the person with an incomplete understanding of what you're saying, and they get to speculate on what you mean, and it usually leads to miscommunication. Metaphors are best used, analogies are best used, after you've concretely explained what you want to say. You've taken the trouble to articulate your exact position. You can say, you know, I don't appreciate the way you always change the subject, Kumi, and the way you have the attention span of a goldfish. No offense to goldfish who actually have quite good memories. They say, you know, it's just a myth, an urban myth. Goldfish actually have good memories, unlike you. And you're just always changing the subject. You never keep your mind on anything for more than like eight seconds or something. The amount of time Pajabi Joyce allows you to hold a pose in, in a shtanga vinyas. And it's really frustrating dealing with you. And so I used a bunch of analogies, but I said what I want to say. You get it? Dealing with you is like dealing with a wild horse running everywhere. An untethered horse running in every direction, wreaking havoc, a bull in a china shop. I can use all the metaphors I want to, all the similes I want to, but you can't not explain your points. Krishna's now done a great job of explaining what he wants to say. That he is the source of everything in existence. That although he's the source of everything in existence, everything is not equally weighted because he has both a direct energy and an indirect energy, a separated energy and a more direct energy. And the direct energy is higher up in the hierarchy, and in fact we see that practically because people use objects. People use stuff in this world. We have power over matter in this world. Right? We want to use things, not people. But using things, that's what the things are there for. When you start using people, it gets problematic. But just stuff by itself, if it's not hurting anybody, is less problematic. That's why the pursuit of happiness is enshrined in the Constitution, provided it doesn't contradict the life and liberty of others. That's where we draw the line on your pursuit of happiness. That's why it comes after. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life and liberty are sacrosanct. Can't violate them. Pursuit of happiness, do your thing, get your freak on, provided it doesn't get in the way of the life and liberty of other people. Once it does, then we put you in the timeout. And so, what you've got here is Krishna saying the whole world comes from me. In one sense, the whole world is my child. But, not everything is equally weighted. I have a superior energy and an inferior energy. And that superior energy animates the inferior energy. Is more important, is more direct, is more like me. It's closer to me. Now watch what Krishna does. And we're just actually starting class now. That was all me warming you guys up to last week. We're now starting class. Forgive me, we're going to go a little late. But it is what it is. Roll with me. It's going to get interesting. And we're going to go fast now. I am the taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon, the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound in space and the ability in mankind. Rasoham 
apsukonteya. Literally, I am the taste of water. Prabhasmi shashi surayoho. I am the light of the sun and the moon. Pranavasava vedishu. In all the Vedas, I am om. Shabda K, I am the sound of space. Parusham, Nrishu, I am the ability in humanity. I am the original fragrance of the earth, the heat and fire, the life of all that lives, and the penance of all ascetics. Know that I am the original seed of all existence, the intelligence of the intelligent, and the prowess of all powerful men. I am the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire. I am sex life, which is not contrary to religious principles. Know that all states of being, be they of goodness, passion, or ignorance, are manifested by my energy. I am in one sense everything, but I am independent. I am not under the modes of material nature, for they, on the contrary, are within me. I, I would have liked to have spent the whole class exploring these verses because they're really beautiful. But what you have Krishna doing now is using very powerful metaphors to connect himself to the world around us such that we don't look at the world as being evil and of the devil where women are evil, money is evil. Now this, this came from this, like, now all the things which tantalize you in the world, all of them became of the devil, and they weren't coming from God. Therefore, you kill yourself in sort of a, a millenarian type situation, where there's a deluge or a fire, or you commit some kind of ritual suicide, or you, you die on the cross like Jesus, you become a martyr like Jesus, or, and you, know, or you suffer while you're in this world because everything in this world is trying to pull you away from God. That's the dualistic worldview. The pagan worldview, which the Gita is much more akin to, the world's actually divinely inspired. You can look around the world and become inspired. The world doesn't have to take you away from God and make you selfish. The world can actually bring you closer to divinity. You can look around the world and be stimulated in your love for divinity. You can see things in this world and see how they're connected to divinity and no longer try to separate them from divinity and enjoy them as if you are God, but rather see they're part of something much greater, as are you, and you can become much more fluid in your dealing with the world and roll with the tide much better and exist in some transcendental current along with reality in a way where you're not trying to steal reality and exploit it and enjoy it, but where you're able to be a steward of things in this world and be inspired by them. You following this? You know, it's like you can paint the, the male or the female form with just like two or three brush strokes. The core of the female form is the breast, hip, breast, hip, torso, that hourglass. If you're, if you're going to do like an abstract, super minimalist drawing of a male and a female, the guy's a box and the female's like a swoosh. She's like that, you got the, the breast and then the in, going into the hip, uh, into, the, into the torso and then out again with the hip. You see some form whichever one you find attractive, you see that form off in the distance. And you think, wow, that's like a sexy person. They've got a great body. They've got a great form. I wonder what their face looks like. Forgive me for being so explicit, but I want you guys to get this. And then that form comes closer and you realize, oh, that's my daughter. Oh, that's my son. Now, most of you are too young. You know, kids are all grown up. My, my kids, my, my sons were in here doing kirtan. A bunch of them are grown up now. Big, strapping men. 
strong men. Um, they went up to LA today to help set up the Rathiatra, and then they wrestled all the kids there. And just devastated them. <laughs> They're, all the kids wanted to have a go, you know? All, the, all these like, young bucks wanted to come and challenge my kids. And they just, then they took a video of it, brought it down, showed it to me. Um, It's a weird phenomenon where even something as basic as lust, as basic as sex desire, is completely transformed instantaneously, effortlessly, automatically, by a higher level of realization, by a higher level of relationship, by, by a higher, you know, yeah, level of relationship with that person. The lust just evaporates in an instant. It's like, oh, that's my daughter. That's replaced by parental love. It may be difficult to understand this if you don't have kids of your own. I, I, I like to think of other examples, but the thing is, lust is the best one. And seeing your child as an adult is this amazing thing that, like, it's just, it's like effortless. Like, there's no lust towards that person because you have a higher level of relationship with them. And it's such that it just makes the lust just evaporate. Like fog, in, 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 you know, on the surface of the sun. It's just gone. So Krishna's explaining here that you can look at the world instead of seeing a world which turns you away from divinity and makes you selfish and an enjoyer. The world in which you live can actually be a stimulus to bring you closer to divinity. The world can make you love Krishna more. It's very world-affirming, life-affirming. It, 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 there's, there's an elegance to this worldview that goes so far beyond the radical dualism of certain religions. It's such a healthier worldview. You don't have to hate anything. Everything has its proper place. Nothing is inherently evil. It's a resolution in many ways to the problem of evil. Because the world starts to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle and make sense. And you realize, oh, wait a second, everything is Everything is, is, is inspirational. Everything can bring out the best in me. Everything can motivate me to be a better person. Nothing brings out the most base qualities in me. Everything can be looked at through a proper lens and I can see its inherent connection to Krishna. Amazingly, Krishna is so expert. He gives you an example of earth, water, fire, air, and space. Sound and space the heat of fire, or the light of fire. The word tejas can be interpreted either way. The fragrance of the earth. You follow? He gives you examples, sensual, tactile examples of all the categories. He goes through the initial list he gave you. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the intelligence of the intelligent. I'm the mind of thoughtful people. He goes through all the eight categories he gave you. I'm the ability in man. Don't think you're the doer. I gave you that ability to be the doer. Even your own independent feeling that you're the doer, that is a spark of my splendor. That's a spark of my light, broken off and given to you. And so Krishna takes the entire material world that he just delineated and connects it to himself that's theology. An explanation of existence in relationship to deity. Krishna explains it concretely, and then he gives you a number of powerful metaphors and similes to explain his relationship to the. And in many ways, these things aren't actually metaphors and similes. Krishna is actually these things, in essence. You follow? Um, and then there's two things I want to, before we call it a day. 
There's two things I want to I want to look at with you guys. Uh, look at text number eleven with me. Balam balavatam chaham. I am the strength of the strong. Kama raga vivarjita. I am the strength of the strong, devoid of desire or attachment. Kama and raga vivarjita. I am the strength of the strong, provided it's without attachment and desire. Why would Krishna modify being the strength of the strong to say it's only the strength of the strong when that strength is devoid of passion or attachment? Why would he say that? Non-rhetorical question. Answer quick, though. Yeah. It's strength used for a good purpose. That's right. Strength is sometimes used to exploit people and hurt people. And Krishna's saying he's not that kind of strength. He's not that exploitative, violent strength. Rather, he's strength which is devoid of desire or attachment, which leads people to misuse their strength. But then that leaves you with a real question. Well, then, what do you do with desire? Is desire evil? Because if you're only the strength of the strong, devoid of desire, then desire becomes the bad guy. You follow? And then Krishna attaches that. He says, Kamo smi. I am desire, dharma avirudha bhuteshu. I am desire, which also, kama also means sex, in beings when it's not in contradiction with dharma. When it's not in contradiction with your innate best nature. And so Krishna is troubleshooting the material world such that he's finding a home for everything. It's very... It, it's actually brilliant. I'm strength of the strong, but let me troubleshoot that, except for when it's being used by exploitative people, with, filled with desire. But then what do you do with desire, Christian? Where does that come from? Oh yeah, I'm desire too, provided it's in accordance with your fundamental nature. It's not some extraneous desire, some artificial desire, which is damaging to yourself. It's a healthy desire. And so Krishna's trying to show you how everything in the world can be used for a good purpose. And he's really troubleshooting. He even goes as far, and this is in text 12, to say that all that is suffic, rajasic, and tamasic, all that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the guna theory, the guna theory, suffa, rajas, and tamas, as the three building blocks of all things in the material world. And Krishna's saying those things also come from him. But then it leads to that thing, well, wait, if tamas comes from Krishna, wouldn't that be roughly equivalent to Krishna saying evil comes from him, darkness comes from him? And then Krishna explains, and this is really far out, he says, mata eva iti tan vidhi, know that they come from me. Then he says, they are in me, nateshu aham. I am not in them. They are in me, I am not in them. This is panentheism, a term which only entered the English language in the 1800s. Um, panentheism is beyond pantheism. Pantheism is everything is divine. Panentheism explains that everything is within the divine and the divine is still beyond all the things that are within it. In other words, it allows for God to be imminent in this world and simultaneously transcendent beyond this world. Normally, religions will focus on one. Transcendent religions would be like Islam and Christianity. Everybody wants to die, go back to heaven. Everything in this world sucks, although it doesn't. Somehow the angels are where you want to be, but the angels are these castrated people who are just staring at the earth all the time. But somehow that's where you want to go. There's going to be some castrated, eunuch-type being up in heaven, staring down at the world, because the world's way cooler than what they got going on up there. But you're going to go up there and like, play a harp and be a cherub. And it's just, it's like, it's like just a weird thing, you know? And so um, that's transcendence. And usually they do nasty stuff, like there's 72 virgins waiting up there with you. They just like imagine, it's some kind of 
material world forever up there, but it's just, it's basically the material world. And you're kind of wondering, like, how do you guys even get to make a claim for transcendence? You're just materialists who are talking about materialism in the afterlife. Real transcendence is the idea that, you know, nothing in this world is for you. Your home is with God beyond this world. You pick up the cross, die on the cross, be a martyr, be an ascetic, live a completely renounced lifestyle. Not so you can enjoy in that world, but because that world is your real home. That's transcendence. And there's something beautiful about transcendence. Without transcendence, you're just like a rotary club. You're just hanging out here, having Catholic mixers or Jewish mixers where you know, people are like meeting each other. and you know, it's, just, it's, 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 it's like a, you're, you're at a church, but you're just doing material stuff. You're doing your 12-step meeting at a church. You know, not the 12-step is necessarily material. But, yeah, you end up with these very imminent traditions in this world where they don't really have anything spiritual about them maybe in name only. But then when you get too transcendent, you have no place for this material world and you're hating the material world. And so you end up with two kinds of religion. Imminent religions, paganism, and a lot of people's version of other traditions. And transcendent religions where you kind of can't wait to die and you hate the world. But there's good in both these ideas. And if you take them too far, they become bad. And so what you have here is Krishna, thousands of years ago, articulating really nicely imminence and transcendence within the deity. The whole world is within me, but don't think the whole world is me. I'm beyond this world, and I also house this world. The world is connected to me, and I also have a higher nature. I'm imminent, and I'm transcendent. You can see me in this world, and you can see me even more in that world. You can see me here, and you can see me later. You can use this world as a springboard to take you to that world. Imminence and transcendence. Normally opposites. Normally, you know, they're, they're not held together in the tradition. Panentheism in Western thought is this radical idea, Spinoza and other people talked about it, but it's this radical idea that's very, very recent of trying to account for both imminence and transcendence within the deity. You find that idea being articulated in the Gita and it is an excellent resolution to the problem of evil. Ignorance is within me, so everything is connected to me as its origin. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that everything is me. And so Krishna resists an absolute equality. The world is in me. I'm not in the world. <coughs> the world is dependent on me. I'm not dependent on the world. The world is housed within me. I'm not merely comprised of what exists in the world. This deserves a whole class but I'm just touching on these ideas with you. So now we're left with the Gita. We explored whatever it was, 12 verses together. <coughs> Krishna laid out an ontology, a theory of everything. It was more elaborate than the first one he gave in the second chapter. It's not as elaborate as what he's going to give in the 13th chapter. But it's here. And after he explained to you how the whole world is connected to him, he gave you a bunch of metaphors and similes and analogies so that you could look at the world through a new set of eyes and no longer felt it, no longer feel that you're being torn away from divinity looking at this world. It's a cure. It's a, it's, it's, it's a paradigm that gives you a new insight into the world which leaves nothing further to be known because everything is inspirational. Everything reminds you of divinity. Everything leads you to divinity. There's no more evil in the world because everything ends up bringing you closer to the divine. And then he, he actually troubleshoots that with the example of desire and strength and really showing you how if you think about it carefully, you can truly start to see everything connected to God. Like for instance, how is rape connected to God? Well, rape isn't, but intimacy and love is. And so the perverted reflection of that is rape. But if you go to the essence of that, at the essence of rape is a desire for intimacy. Intimacy is good. That perverted manifestation of it is bad. Power is good. Power used to exploit others is bad. If you rape is one of two things. Either A, it's just wanton lust. Some people say rape is all about power. It's not true. Violent rape is all about power. Date rape is just people are lusty and they can't, they can't negotiate their way into sex life consensually, and so they, they use drugs 
there may be a power aspect to it, but it's also just wanton and uncontrolled lust so much that you forget about the people you're, that are around you and what you're doing to them. And so from both points of view, from rape as being a, 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 a poor attempt at intimacy, or alternatively, rape as being a power game, power and intimacy are good. That particular manifestation is bad. You can take anything in the world, and if you essentialize enough and you unpack it enough, you can find out it's like actually, they, ah, that's where it went wrong. And by knowing where it went wrong, you now know how to bring it back and fix it. And now the whole material world is fixable, and nothing truly tears you away from divinity. And everything actually can bring you towards divinity. And Krishna manages to go through all of his previous examples, and then he starts to troubleshoot big stuff, like the existence of tamas, which is the closest thing you get. There's no evil. There's no Sanskrit word for evil. The closer you get are words like tamas or pa, but they don't mean evil. It has some sort of fundamental malefic force. And so then Krishna even troubleshoots tamas, darkness, by relating to himself, but then blowing our mind. They are in me. I'm not in them. They're dependent on me. They evolved from me. But that's not me. I'm beyond that. And of course, there has to be darkness in this world. Because you have to have the option to turn away from divinity. And therefore, we create the darkness. And that goes back to this idea of karma. You've got to hang everything on our head. But Krishna allows it to happen. And actually, if Krishna did give us the option of making mistakes and doing things wrong and embracing all sorts of darkness, then there would be no possibility of love. Love requires free will. And so a really good deity would make the world with living entities with free will, risking that they could misuse that free will, because a, a world with free will and the possibility of bad things is better than a world without free will and no possibility of love. And so we're still left with the best of all possible worlds. So I want to give you guys a sense of working with ideas and troubleshooting them and thinking through them. Also, literally what Krishna's saying how we're starting to get it again in the seventh chapter, how it's way more theistic, the, the value of analogies, the completeness of Krishna's line of thought, the elegance and systematic nature of what Krishna teaches in the Gita. I want to kind of give you guys a little bit of an intro to all that. And so we're done. Thank you, IGTV. Any feedback? Yes. <laughs>